Dear graduates of the class of 2018, allow me to congratulate you as well as your family and your professors who made it possible for you to be here today. It's indeed a pleasure and a great honor to be invited to give the commencement address and to be a recipient of an honorary doctorate degree from a school which is an international leader in medical and scientific training, biomedical research, and patient care. Thank you, Dr. Nessler, for that kind introduction. Thank you, Dean Charney, and your entire faculty for bestowing this honor on me. And thank you, Dr. Prabhjot Singh, who I have known from a very young age and had the pleasure and honor of advising and mentoring. He is a formidable leader in public health, a pride to all of us, and like a son to me. I want to start today by telling you a story from 60 years ago about a frail little girl, five-year-old, who contracted measles. Before I tell you about her, let's all take a moment to think about the thousands of children who are separated from their families at the border. After 15 days of blindness and several doses of traditional medicine, the little girl woke up one morning announcing to her mother that she could finally see her. What a miracle. Beating the odds, she survived the measles only to contract dysentery a few months later. Her single mother of four was fighting to make ends meet with no money or food, let alone vaccines or medication. Her mother was not poor. She had land, but back then, and still true today, being a single mother, she depended on men to till her land, and they always shortchanged her. Our girl survived both infections. She went to school in her small village and grew up receiving fortified milk by, provided by UNICEF to poor countries. In elementary school, her Peace Corps teachers instilled the love of reading and the gift of books. She had no book of her own and lived in a house with no electricity. But her brother, who filled the role of her father, made sure she continued her education. He took her to the capital city for high school and provided her with secondhand books, both from departing foreigners, ensuring she could read as much as she wanted. She devoured books, and what was meant to keep her busy for summer vacation often only kept her for a few weeks. It was very common to find her reading hidden in boxes living in the wonderful world of books, escaping from her life's problems. She traveled to France, reading Rebecca, the United Kingdom, reciting William Shakespeare, to Nigeria with Chinua Achebe, and to the United States, studying John Steinbeck. Again, as to all odds, constantly challenging damning statistics, that little girl grew up. Against all odds, she went to college and attended one of the best graduate schools in the world. And against all odds, she found herself in the middle of one of the worst epidemics of her lifetime. Dear graduates, the master's degree you receive today is critical. It is a license to do your best and to make the world a better place. Imagine what you could have done to decrease infant mortality. Think of that little girl and think of those who never made it to their fifth birthday because they were born in the wrong part of the world. Think of those with limited access to the kind of education you received and the innovations that you have been part of. Your graduation puts you among those who are armed with knowledge to prevent care and treat diseases, but also to fight injustice and poverty. 
A lot of frustrations await you as you join the health workforce because the world out there is full of injustice, there is lack of basic human rights, and health is a human right. There is abundance of poverty, and health will falter in poverty. I struggled with what I could say to you, the 2018 graduates. How would I keep you awake and away from your cell phones and tell you something you would remember? What does a black immigrant woman from one of the poorest countries in the world have to tell young, eager graduates from the Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai? I decided if I could do it, each and every one of you could do it better. And I chose to share my life's journey with you. My first degree was in biology and chemistry from Addis Ababa University in Ethiopia. There were no computers, minimal books. And we spent our Saturdays and Sundays in the library fighting for a chance to study with the reference books for one hour. After the graduation and after spending a year at the National Research Institute of Health, I got a scholarship to study immunology at St. Mary's Hospital Medical School in London. By the way, that's the hospital where all royal children are born. <laughs> Towards the end of my graduate work, an unknown disease was causing havoc all over the world. I successfully defended my thesis and moved to California to do my postdoc at a company called SIVA in Mountain View that was developing deep stick assays for chlamydia. I had been making all my reagents while doing my PhD in London, but I was flabbergasted that I could buy everything I needed for my research just by making a phone call at SIVA. Although convenient, it was my British education that became handy when I returned to Ethiopia. In 1984, just as the AIDS epidemic was unfolding, with a homemade Western blot, I became part of the team that diagnosed the first AIDS patient in Ethiopia. Little did I know then that I was about to spend a good part of my life working on this epidemic. Fighting a new epidemic in a resource-poor setting is challenging. While there is nothing positive about the AIDS epidemic, the global solidarity, which still exists today, is exemplary. Scientists from the North and the South collaborated as equal partners with mutual respect. At the same time, activism rose to a different level. It was gay men and women in the North with their brothers and sisters from the South who began naming and shaming pharmaceutical companies and rich governments, making it possible for AIDS patients in resource-poor countries to have access to treatment. Right here in New York City, ACT UP, along with the Treatment Action Coalition of South Africa, led the charge. After setting up the National AIDS Program in Ethiopia, I went to Harvard University as a MacArthur Fellow, where I opened my eyes to women's health and their particular vulnerability. I then joined AIDSCAP, funded by USAID, to work on AIDS in 16 African countries. The beginning of the HIV AIDS epidemic was, was a time where resource poor countries totally depended on external assistance to fight the epidemic. While the effort was noble on the part of developed countries, the way development aid was administered then, and to a lesser extent now, resulted in unnecessary waste. There were strings attached to aid, which included a one-size-fits-all approach to programs, along with the requirement to buy equipment and hire consultants from the donor country with total disregard for capacity building and long-term sustainability. A friend of mine who became Minister of Health in her country once said to donors, I quote, for every dollar you give us, you take away 67 cents. It's about time I call the shots, end of quote. Needless to say, she didn't last long, and needless to say, there was a lot of waste and frustration. 
Understanding local re realities and country ownership was not as common as it is today. Donor representatives were young, arrogant, and inexperienced. They came armed with textbook knowledge of whatever worked in the North and were too arrogant to listen to us in the South. Both in Ethiopia and while working for EDSCAP, many donor representatives knew me as that unknowing short woman. <laughs> However, and more importantly, those who understood country needs, ownership, and sovereignty respected me. If I knew an idea was not going to work, I held my ground. I did not give in. That not only required a lot of personal courage, but was, a, was risky because if I was reported to any of the governments, I'd be accused of prohibiting funds coming to save poor people. When I was the director of aid, the AIDS National Program in Ethiopia, a young woman from a donor country came to my office to discuss potential funding for our program. Her opening sentence was, I quote, is it because Ethiopians are promiscuous that you have so much AIDS? End of quote. Graduates, I leave it to your imagination to guess what I said to her <laughs> before asking her to leave my office. Three years ago, when I became a senior leadership fellow at the Harvard T. Chan School of Public Health, which provided me with a chance to teach, what I mentioned above became the reason for developing a course titled Leadership in Public Health, which I taught there and continued to teach at CUNY at the School of Public Health and Health Policy. In short, the course is about understanding local realities and garnering respect for countries, which invariably leads to good results for both the recipient and the donor. The philosophy, the philosophy being to doing development and public health for results with respect. Dear graduates, listening and understanding to local realities, respecting the people you serve, and spending taxpayers' money appropriately is important in and of itself but it also ensures results. The people you serve may be poor, but they know and understand their reality better than you do. As you move into the world of work and join the development agencies, please remember the poor and the sick are human and not only deserve your empathy, they deserve your respect. For those of you who have come from abroad and will go back to your respective countries, do not be intimidated by donor representatives. Remember that representative sat next to you in graduate school and got the same education as you. While she brings the money, you bring the country's realities, and together you can do wonders. Remember that. But what lies ahead of you today is more education. Personally, my greatest education didn't come from the University of London or Harvard. It came from the World Bank, where I served for 20 years. The bank I joined in 1994 was full of hardcore economists who insisted that the bank should not get involved in HIV AIDS work. Their rationale, it was not cost effective. Although this is an organization established to fight poverty, it took years of convincing and for us to make the connection between declines in life expectancy and age before the bank put the first billion dollars on the table in the year 2000, which I had the privilege to lead. This enabled countries to have enough resources to fight this epidemic at national level for the first time since the beginning of the epidemic, and it saved millions of lives. The Global Fund and PEPFAR came much later. Let me digress a bit to tell you about the first time we attempted to distribute red ribbons for staff on World AIDS Day in 1996. Needless to say, there were very few takers. A few years of relentless campaigning to put AIDS at the center of the development agenda, and not only did we get many to wear the red ribbon, we managed to hang a 
came full thread driven from the main build of the building of the World Bank, which appears every single world edge day to this day. If you persist, even all ships turn. For a black woman from a developing country to lead this charge for the bank was like sending a mouse into the lion's den. But what a privilege. I was in a position to take on this task because of two things. First, I had hands-on experience. I knew the science, program design and implementation better than anyone at the bank. Second, I joined the bank with a determination to make a difference. I had seen the devastating impact of the epidemic and was not afraid of a bunch of economists whose mantra was cost effectiveness. What's more cost effective than saving human lives? I was fearless. And as my Angelo put it, I came in as one and I stood as 10,000. Dear graduates, you are armed with the best education you can get. Use it to make this world a better place. Save lives, and more importantly, do not put a premium on human life. Everyone's life is precious. The satisfaction you will get is priceless. The World Bank, like many organizations, is highly competitive. As a black woman from a developing country, I had to prove myself every single time and work harder than a black man, a white woman, and a white man. My drive came from many sources. First, I was a single mother with two daughters to raise. Second, I grew up in a country that was never colonized. I had never been discriminated against because of my race. My family motivation, combined with the confidence that had never been stifled by racism, enabled me to to let incidents slide. There were countless times when countries in both the North and the South who refused to acknowledge me as a delegation leader. There were countless times when hosts would look past me just to address a white man in the team. Those incidents embarrassed my colleagues, but I always let people make a fool of themselves for a few minutes <laughs> before I smiled and introduced myself. My strength was working very hard, always being a few steps ahead of others, and a ton of self-confidence. There's no compromise here. If you are marginalized for any reason, you have to make it impossible for those who discriminate against you by not only being better, but by being excellent. In many cases, the very reason that you are marginalized is what will make you great. However, until the world gets its acts together, you have to try and try and try to make it impossible for those who are trying to bring you down. Remember to make it easier for those who are ready to pick you up. Trust me, there are much more of the latter than the former. Continue to see the positive in others, and remember to forgive their ignorance. Be fearless, do your research, speak out, and defend your position with evidence. Coming from a developing country with no network insight, I had no idea what the salary scale was at the bank. I only found out I was paid less than the people I was supervising when I applied and received a promotion to lead the billion dollar project I mentioned earlier. My salary was less than the floor of the new level when it should have been closer to the middle. Correcting the salary gap required increase of several thousands of dollars. This was unheard of and human resources was not prepared to do so. It took a courageous man, my boss, who is an ally and friend who knew my worth and believed in me to force the institution to adjust my salary. As you join the workforce, remember, human resources does not work for you. Their job is to get the best people with less money for the institution. Your job, your job is to know your self-worth. And don't forget, if you are a woman, 
black, and from a developing country, you are a prime target. Use your ample resources, find your allies, and do your homework before you go for an interview. In this month's Lancet, there is an article called Unpaid Labor, Me Too, and Young Women in Global Health. You will see the stark reality of women, women in science and medicine. The article calls out the scarcity of women in leadership despite their overrepresentation in medical and life science graduate programs and the global health workforce. While women have been fighting for equality for centuries, the Me Too movement is a watershed moment. Dear graduates, your place is with these brave women fighting alongside them. Choose not to be a bystander. As I finish my talk, let me come back to the little girl you met at the beginning. I hope you haven't forgotten her. She is standing in front of you, living proof. <laughs> living proof of what it means to be given a chance to live. Remember her brother, the one who bought books for her? He is here today, and she would like to say thank you. I used to drink the fortified milk provided by UNICEF. Now, I co-chair the UNICEF task force on sexual harassment and gender discrimination. My, my two little girls put up with constant absence and sit here today as, a, as formidable young women. One engaged in fighting against childhood pneumonia as a medical doctor and one investigating allegations of NYPD misconduct as a lawyer. <laughs> what else can a workaholic immigrant mother wish for? All those places I read about in my books, I have traveled to them, seen them, and explored them. Standing in front of you today, I stand as a testament for perseverance, global solidarity, and the right to live. Dear graduates of 2018, if I, the five-year-old from very humble background, could not only beat the measles and dysentery, but could do enough to stand before you being recognized today, then for you, the sky is the limit. Go and make the world a better place. I thank you.